Take your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians 11. If you have your cup and wafer for our communion time together, does anybody need a communion cup and wafer? So good an introduction to the Lord's table this morning. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Paul writes 1 Corinthians 11, beginning in verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. Then the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this. As often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And that's what we do. We come together just like those disciples with the Lord on that night that he was betrayed. Take bread, take the cup, we proclaim the Lord's death. We proclaim that Jesus died for me. We proclaim that Jesus died for us because the wages of sin is death. The bread helps us remember that he took on human flesh to pay for human sin. He didn't have to do that. Oh, maybe I, we could say in a way he did because he loved us so much. God so loved the world that he gave us when he got us. The cup helps us remember that there is a new covenant. The old covenant was, okay, God gave me your commands. I'll keep them. That's what Israel said. The day God gave his commands to Israel, we'll keep your commands. Well, right, right. But in the new covenant, God gives us a spiritual salvation by the power of the Holy Spirit applying the death of Christ to us and joining us to Jesus Christ in new life. We take that cup, we remember that new covenant. We're part of that. I want to draw our attention to you. If you have to have your Bible open, um, I don't. It really would take a whole sermon to explain everything Paul says here in, in this section. But I, I want to bring your attention to a thought in verse 33. So then, my brothers, having them, having instructed them about the importance of the Lord's table, he says, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. Well, why does he say that? Well, if you read the whole chapter, the Christians in the church in Corinth were not being very considerate of each other. Well, he was talking about that in our adult Sunday school classes. You know, some of those brothers and sisters were slaves. They couldn't just go to church anytime they wanted to. They had their duties they had to do. So they make it their late. And Paul says, be considerate. This is the family of God. Play for each other. Include everybody, everybody you can. 
we've been talking for the last month about missions and the fact that we are partners together in God's work. Partners equipped by God to do his work of reaching lost souls for Christ. When we take the bread and we take the cup, we proclaim the Lord's death and we do it as a family. As a family. <coughs> take the cup. Remove the cellophane wrapped around the top to take the cup. Wait for the bread. Unleavened bread, as they use the Passover, because it represents the body of Christ. Leaven or yeast in Scripture is a symbol of sin. God the Father made God the Son who knew no sin to be sin for us. When he given thanks, he broke the bread and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Remember his body together. Constantly. 
All that we must practice as Paul lays it out in chapters 12 through 16, living out the life of Christ flows from this. We began to see this in chapter 6, verse 11. So you must also constantly consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. That is what we are. That's who we are. Paul's talking about the same thing in Colossians 3. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. This changes everything. It's life transforming. And it gets right down to the nitty gritty details, like how we think about each other in the family of God. How we treat each other in God's family. If your faith does not touch the details of your life, don't fool yourself that you're walking in faith and obedience. The Holy Spirit of God did not move Paul to write this letter for us to ignore it. Not even to ignore the last few chapters. A month ago we were looking at chapter 14 verse 1 through the first seven verses of chapter 15. That's the last in some ways, practical section. This is how you live out the Christian life. And Paul forces us to think biblically about what we do when two Christians don't agree on something. We need to understand the unity of the church. The church is one part, the body of Christ. We need to know how to live out that principle. We Read through this section, we found that Christians in Rome were divided over special diets and special days. They began to criticize each other, and groups were formed around these two camps. And Paul lays out principles that we must apply to the controversies of today. There are some things the Bible clearly says are wrong. We don't compromise on those. But what do we do about inactivity that the scriptures don't specifically talk about? And Paul explains how we can go about operating in Christian unity even when we don't honestly agree on something. We quoted Augustine who said, In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. Or in modern translation, in all things, agape love. Because it takes a God they love to practice the principles that Paul lays out here. Like so much in the Christian life, our problem is our attitude. Paul shows us that if we're going to practice the unity of the church, Christians must have a welcoming attitude. He begins chapter 14 by saying, As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything, while the, the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains. Let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats. For God has welcomed him. Now, probably no one is going to condemn you in this church because of what you eat. Unless, of course, they're into natural foods and supplements. And then they might condemn you. My uh, sister-in-law told us that women in her church were talking about, you know, how they fed their families, and she mentioned what she did, and she said, they looked at me and they said, you use processed sugar? <laughs> she said, I felt like a heel. <laughs> now, praise the Lord, she did not get mad and leave her church. But whatever our views are, maybe on any activity, we need to have a welcoming attitude towards one another. The attitude that you're welcome only if you agree with me does not understand the unity of the body of Christ. Now, remember, Paul is instructing two groups here. One he calls strong there in, 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 in uh, chapter 15, verse 1. Uh, and he's instructing them 
in their attitude towards those he calls weak in faith. In verse 1 we, we just read. Well, how are they strong? Well, they're strong in faith. Their faith is firmly in the finished work of Christ. Doing this activity or that activity does not change that. And they know it. Now, those who are weak in faith are immature believers. They feel the need to keep legalistic rules to obey God. I've heard many Christians say, the more rules you have, the stronger you are. Well, that's not what the scripture says. The weak Christians were judging and condemning the strong Christians. The strong Christians were despising the weak Christians. And when that happens, there is no unity in the church. So Paul says, welcome one another, because God welcomed us, every single one who's placed their faith in Jesus Christ. Paul says we are not to pass judgment on one another. We are to pass judgment on things the scripture says are sinful, but we're not to make ourselves judges of each other. Verse 4. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. We are the servants. We're not the judges. Dr. Wiersbe points out that if we were busy about using our gifts in the Lord's service, we probably would not have time to investigate what other people are doing. And Paul goes on then to teach us that we must have a brotherly attitude towards each other. We're not to just ignore each other. We're to build each other up in the faith. That's what brothers and sisters do. Verse 13. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or a hindrance in the way of a brother. Each of us as members of the body of Christ need to ask ourselves, what kind of effect do I have on my brothers and sisters? It's not all about me. The main point of the Christian life is not, what do I want to do? That's not the point. The main point is, will I glorify God? And will I build up my brothers and sisters in Christ? Verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking or any other outward thing. There we go. This is a new thing. I, I have a new Bible program and it does this automatically. I does this. Every time I copy a verse into my sermon notes, it'll go make a slide for me. So, as long as I don't just keep going on ahead and not realize the slide is advanced or not advanced. Anyway. Okay. All right. The point is, will I glorify God? Will I build up my brothers and sisters in Christ? Verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking. Or any other outward thing, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. When the world outside peeks into the windows of the church, what do they see? They see our priorities. We need to make sure our priorities are God's priorities. Righteousness and peace. Enjoy in the Holy Spirit. Those are acceptable to God. Those advance the true unity of the church. Now, let's go on. Verse 19. <coughs> so then, let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Mutual upbuilding. Building each other up. Here's the thing. Every Christian needs to grow. Strong believers and weak believers. It's, it's no good saying, well, he needs to grow. The fact is, we all need to grow. It needs to be mutual upbuilding, helping each other grow. Now, I think we can see how the, the, the weak believer, the one who is all worried about touch not, taste not, don't, don't wear this, don't sing that. You see, that person needs to grow in knowledge. Doesn't, he doesn't fully understand who he is in Christ. That's 
Why are you so fearful of all these upward things? But does the strong believer need to grow? I mean, he's, he's already strong in faith. Oh, yes. The strong believer needs to grow too. He or she needs to grow in love. If he gets in the face of a weaker brother and inconsiderately does things the weaker brother finds are bothersome, he thinks they're, they're, they're wrong. If the strong brother does that, he can do some real damage. Look carefully at what Paul says, verse uh, 20. Do not for the sake of food or whatever other thing destroy the work of God. Now, Look at that again. First part of verse 20. Do not for the sake of food or whatever outward thing. Food is just the issue back in Paul's day. Do not for the sake of food destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean. Remember they had certain foods that were considered unclean to the new Christians. Eating meat sacrificed to an idol. That's it's an unclean thing. Everything is indeed clean, but it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. See, if you love someone, you want them to grow. If you love someone, you'll help them grow. If a Christian remains immature, their conscience is weak, they're bothered by all kinds of awkward things, it's not right for them to stay there. But it's also wrong to willfully offend or confuse someone who's struggling with whether something is right for a Christian to do. If we discourage them and stop them in their forward progress, we are the ones who do wrong. <coughs> Paul says that if you choose not to do something at a time or place that a brother or sister would see it and think, oh, why are they doing that? Paul says, that's good not to do that. You know, when a child comes into the home, Gary was kind of excited, she got to take care of a baby this morning. We don't get to do that anymore. Our house is, well, kind of. <laughs> but uh, when a child comes into the home, you, you child-proof the home, right? Or you quickly say, oh, we got to child-proof this home. Nothing raises Karen's higher quicker than finding a pair of scissors laying around the house at Portage. What do you think you're doing? Don't you know Lexi could pick these things up? Followed by an embarrassed, sorry, the guilty party who's... I won't say their name, but both of them end with a C. But, uh, the guilty party didn't think mature Christians need to think. That's part of being mature, isn't it? But, you know, as a child grows, the, the parents can adjust their rules and deal with the child in a more mature manner. You know, not as many rules are needed. Now, Lexi will never grow up. We just need to be constantly vigilant for the rest of her life. But... A normal child grows, physically and in understanding. Young Christians need the kind of church family that will protect them and also help them grow. Not every weaker brother is going to listen real well. I was having a discussion with a Christian who was very much in the mindset of the weaker brother I pointed out that Paul said, let not the one who eats despise one who abstains, let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats. And he responded, yeah, but Paul said not to do anything that makes your weaker brother stumble. Basically, he was telling me that the whole ministry of the church needs to be geared only to baby Christians. So, in his mind, women are not to wear pants, we're never to go to movies, we're only to sing songs out of the hymn book. And that's the way the ministry stays for the foreseeable future. Well, but see, younger Christians need to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
And as they mature in faith, they can help other believers grow. The weak must learn from the strong, and the strong must love the weak. And the result is peace and maturity and God be glorified. Chuck Swindoll shares his own journey on this. He said, in my own experience, I have found that my list of universal standards has grown shorter as I have grown older. When I first graduated from seminary, I would die defending any one of a hundred different theological hills and had a long list of absolutely essential do's and don'ts. Today, my list is much shorter. On the other hand, there are several matters for which I once felt complete liberty, but now my conscience no longer allows me to participate in them. So, for me personally, those things are off limits. Thankfully, I'm still growing up. End of quote. Look at verse 22 and 23. The faith that you have, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. But whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats, because the eating is not from faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. Now once again, let, let's be clear. There are certain truths clearly taught in Scripture that are not negotiable. If you do not believe them, you are not a Christian. I know there are churches out there that will welcome you and call you a Christian if you don't believe these things. But we're talking about apostolic Christianity here. The faith given to the apostles to pass on to those who trust Jesus as their Savior. You're not a Christian if you're not a Christian by God's definition. And his is the one who counts because he is the one each one of us will stand before to be judged. The divinity of Christ, the substitutionary atonement on the cross for the forgiveness of sins, the literal bodily resurrection, justification by faith alone and the finished work of Christ, these truths are indispensable. If you don't believe them and stick your life on them, you are not a Christian, not by God's definition. Adultery is sin. It violates the command of God. Lying is sin. It violates the command of God. We don't negotiate on what God says is wrong. Now I'll bring up a hot button topic that churches are divided on today. In chapter 1, of Oh, that was back in 2019. In chapter 1, we read that when women pursue passionate relations with women and men pursue them with men, the Holy Spirit, through Paul, calls them dishonorable passions from a debased mind. And while we love the sinner, after all, we are all sinners. We don't follow the thinking of a society that's turned its back on its creator. But there are honest disagreements among born-again Christians about making various choices and participating in various activities. Paul's point is that we ought not to force our opinion on others. In Paul's day, eating meat was a great point of, con of contention because a portion of that meat may have been offered to a pagan idol. In today's disagreements, Hold to your honest opinion, but don't force it on everyone else. If an immature Christian does something that violates his conscience, he has put a stumbling block in the way of his walk with God, and that is a problem. And if a mature Christian, mature in now a way, pressures an immature Christian to violate his conscience, he's made the problem worse. He's not mature in love. If the mature Christian is gentle and understanding and teaching the truth in a loving and unthreatening way 
the younger Christian can grow and develop a strong conscience founded on the rock of the finished work of Christ. And what he does will be done in faith. Here's the thing. Why are we here? Well, there's a lunch after church. Well, why are we not only in the building? Why are we on this earth? Most people, if they're honest, would say, I'm here to please myself. Children's movies these days are all about that. Don't worry about your parents or anywhere else. Just please yourself. But that's another sermon. So. Christians who are growing in grace and in the knowledge of the truth know better. Go on to chapter 15. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the feelings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Suppose there are Christians in your church who are weak in faith. They're bothered by things that you see no problem with. Do we have to put up with them? Can't we just tell them to take a hike? Now, you're chuckling, so you, you see... You see, that's obviously not a good idea. But, well, can't we just ignore them and do our own thing? No! We have, Paul says, an obligation to bear with the feeling of the weak and not to please ourselves. Why can't we just please ourselves? Remember, remember the old song, can't please everyone, so you got to please yourself. No, we can't. That's what a lost, Satan-dominated world system does. That's, that's why people go to war and make other people suffer. We are Christians. We can't just please ourselves because Jesus did not please himself. Look at the scriptures. They instruct us. Paul quotes the Messianic prophecy in Psalm 69.9 about how Christ did not come to please himself but to suffer for us. Do, do you think it's some great sacrifice for you to give up some food or drink or some activity you like. Is that a great sacrifice? Good night! That's what my dad used to say. <laughs> Look at what Jesus sacrificed for us. Look at Gethsemane. Look at his trial. Look, if you dare, at the cross. That puts it in perspective. So Paul prays for us. You say, well, he's praying for the Christians in Rome. Well, that's true, but he's praying for us too. The Holy Spirit is moving him to do that. Verse 5. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus that together you may with one voice glorify God the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about. The glory of God. God is glorified when people see him in us, when they see Christ in us. Then God is glorified. In, in, in Genesis 13, the pagan tribes were watching Abraham and his nephew Lot. So Abraham said, 
Please let there be no strife between you and me, for we are brothers. Let's show them we're different. God's people are different. If you're in Christ, you're different. And so Paul concludes, verse 7, Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. It's all about the glory of God. 